Today I've got this nice problem, which was question A4 from the 1970 Putnam exam. And what I really like about this problem is it looks like something that would be a homework exercise for a real analysis class. So that's exactly how we will approach it with all of the rigor and using definitions and stuff from an introductory real analysis class. Okay, so let's look at the statement. So let's say we've got a sequence of numbers x, n. So this is n goes from one to infinity, although I haven't written that. Those are real numbers and they satisfy the following limit. So the limit is n goes to infinity of x, n minus x, n minus two is equal to zero. And what we wanna do is show that the limit is n goes to infinity of x, n minus x, n minus one over n equals zero. So I think this is pretty interesting. It's kind of obvious that this should imply this, but it actually takes a little bit of work as we'll see. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna run this like it would be a homework problem in a real analysis class. So let's see, we'll probably wanna start with some sort of epsilon bigger than zero. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Then let's take our capital N, maybe I'll call it N1, which is a natural number such that if little n is bigger than or equal to n1, we have, well, whatever the corresponding fact is about this limit converging to zero is. And that is the absolute value of xn minus xn minus two is less than epsilon. But as we'll see moving on through this solution, it's actually a little bit nicer to write this as epsilon over two instead of just epsilon. And also, as we'll see, we'll take another value of n later. That's why I'm using n1 here. Okay, so we've essentially used the fact that is in this green box, but we've written it down carefully with this epsilon n notation. Now we're ready to try to prove what's in this red box, so we'll look at this object right here. And so let's do that. We want to look at the absolute value of xn minus xn minus 1 over n. And we want to somehow bound that below epsilon, given that this thing is bound below epsilon over 2. But notice these are consecutive. We have xn, xn minus 1. Well, these have something in the middle, and that's xn minus 1. So we might want to add and subtract the same thing, in other words, add zero, in order to use this over here. So let's see, maybe we'll subtract xn minus two and then add xn minus two. Well, look, that's just adding zero. And what is that going to leave us with? That's gonna leave us with xn minus xn minus two, and then, xn minus one minus xn minus two. And I've separated out the absolute values and thus I have an inequality via the triangle inequality. Now these are both over n. So essentially this is from the subtracting xn minus two, this is from the adding xn minus two, but like I said, we separated them out with the triangle inequality using, like I said, this inequality. And now we're gonna continue. So this part is good. So if n is large enough, this stuff in here is less than epsilon. So that's cool. But this stuff is not good. Notice those differ by one instead of two. So we probably wanna subtract an xn minus three and add an xn minus three in order to set it up so that we have some difference by two. So we'll do the same kind of thing, apply the triangle inequality again, and let's see what we get. So all of this will be less than absolute value of xn minus xn minus two over n, it's like this first term, plus absolute value of xn minus one, plus minus xn minus three all over two, and then plus absolute value of xn minus two minus xn minus three all over n. I should say this was over n. Okay, so this just came straight down and then the triangle inequality was applied on that. 
Now we can see that this term in the numerator is less than epsilon, this term in the numerator is less than epsilon, but that only has a difference of one between the two terms instead of a difference of two between the two indices, I should say. So there's still some work to do on that. But we can descend this all the way down to n1, and that's exactly what we'll wanna do. So let's keep doing this procedure where we add and subtract something to this last term in order to pull out these two terms that have a difference of two between their indices. So that's going to leave me with L factor of 1 over n out, and then I'll have absolute value of xn minus xn minus 2 plus absolute value of xn minus 1 minus xn minus 3 all the way down to, well, how far are we going to go down? we're going to go until we hit this n1 number. So I think it's gonna look a little something like this, plus the absolute value of xn1 plus two minus xn1. Okay, so that's the last one that we can, you know, reasonably take out this difference of two between the indices. And then what are we left over with? We're left over with the absolute value of x n1 plus 1 minus x n1 all over 2, like that. Okay, great. But now, let's notice that this guy right here is less than epsilon. Oh, I realize that all of these should have been less than epsilon over 2 by our assumption up there, not just epsilon. So this one's less than epsilon over 2, this one's less than epsilon over 2, this one way out here is less than epsilon over 2. And how many of those do we have? Well, we have n minus something having to do with n1 plus 2 or something. But suffice it to say, we have less than n of these. So the total number of these is less than n. So when we add them up, we might as well add n of them up and put in another inequality. And let's do that. This is going to be less than 1 over n times n times epsilon over 2. Again, we got that inequality because we're actually adding up less than n of them. But we did that so that we could cancel this n out nicely. Okay, and then we're left with this other term at the end. So absolute value of xn1 plus 1 minus xn1 all over n. And I see that this should have been n. Okay, so that's where we are so far. Maybe I'll bring this up here and we're ready to finish it off. So on the last board, we chose our epsilon and our capital N1 having to do with the convergence of this thing in green, making the absolute value of that stuff less than epsilon over two. Like I said, that is possible because of the convergence of this green limit over here. Then we took some sort of n bigger than or equal to n1 and looked at the object in question, like our goal object. And then after some algebraic decomposition, we saw that was less than epsilon over two plus x sub n1 plus one minus x sub n1 all over n. But there's something really nice going on here. And that is that this is a constant. Well, you might say, well, it's got an index there, but that index is fixed by this choice up here. That index was fixed so that if we took a number bigger than that index, we had this kind of action with the inequality because of our convergence. So that means we can choose another n, and so let's do that. So let's choose another n, I'll call it n2. Notice that's most definitely gonna be bigger than n1. I'll let you guys think about exactly why that is, but we might as well take it bigger than n1. Otherwise, this first decomposition did not really make sense. And how do we want to choose that? So that the absolute value of xn1 plus 1 minus xn1 all over capital N2 is less than epsilon. 
You might say, well, that doesn't look super possible, but let's remember that this is a constant. Maybe we'll call this constant A, and notice that that makes this statement up here equivalent to choosing N2 that is bigger than A over epsilon. Well, let's recall that A over epsilon is a real number, and by the Archimedean principle, we can always find a natural number larger than any real number. And that's what we've done, this n2. And now while we're at it, I'm just going to say that this is less than epsilon over 2. We can make that as small as we want. And that's going to put maybe a 2 right here. So that'll be 2a over epsilon. Again, by the Archimedean principle, that's possible. Okay, but now we're essentially done. So now notice if little n is bigger than or equal to n2, which is strictly bigger than n1, we have the absolute value of xn minus xn minus 1 over n is less than epsilon over 2 plus, so that epsilon over 2 comes from the last board, which essentially came from this bit right here, expand it out, and then this thing right here, but we just chose our n2 so that that's also less than epsilon over 2. So we have our goal object is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, but that is epsilon. But that's exactly the inequality that we needed to end with to prove this limit. And that's a good place to stop.